everybody. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my fabulous co-hosts. Hey, Rob, it's Diana. And it's Jackie, and I still cannot get over the amazing <laughs> intro. I honestly almost didn't talk, so I was like, oh, I, haven't, I hadn't heard it live, pumped into the, into the mixer, so good. it's really cool. Do you know what it reminds me of a little bit? When I was a young kid, I used to watch Fred Penner's Place. You guys probably didn't because it's a no, CBC it's a good, original, yeah. mm-hmm. but Fred Penner is like this guy who's outdoorsy, and in the beginning, it's all that, and he crawls through a log. <laughs> oh, that brought me back. I don't think that's a TV show, Jackie. I think you had a creepy neighbor. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I didn't. Fred Penner's place. Everyone look it up. It's good. Oh, okay. Nice. That's the new version of our song. I What's know. The new I version just of love our song? it. It's been playing in the episodes. I just haven't. I think it's the first time we've done it the live. No, I'm just telling our audience. Oh, okay. This is the new version of our song. Yes. New version of our song. Produced by none other than Dr. Jim Carr. That's, That's right. right. So welcome. This is not the podcast where we talk about uh, CBC television and our own theme song. Actually, it is. <laughs> like some sort of Uruburos of podcast. No, this is a podcast about behavior analysis and behavior analytic research where every week we pick a topic in behavior analysis and we talk all about related research. And sometimes we're even fortunate enough to have a special guest. And we actually do have a special guest on our line right now. It's not Fred Penner. Now, Jackie now is showing me pictures of Fred Penner. No, that's not who we have. It's actually Dr. Adityan Rajaraman. Ditu, hi, how are you? Thank you so much for having me. Oh, Ditu, it's great to have you on. You have been someone that we've talked to a bunch of times at Babbitt and other times. And I know you're very passionate about our topic this week, which is the interview informed synthesized contingency analysis, aka the ISCA. Hooray! Hooray. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I'm super psyched to talk about this. I kind of can't believe that it's been this many episodes and this is the first time that this is kind of getting a main feature. So I'm very honored to be here with you. Yeah. Yeah. We talked a little bit about latency. We did, but we buried the lead on that one. That's true. We did. 66 with Joshua Jessel. You talk about latency FAs, but for his research, it was in the context of the ISCA. Here we're going straight up talk about the ISCA. But first, we should find out all about D2. Yes. Yes, D2, please I tell us wait. all about yourself. Who are you? Where did you come from? How did you get involved with the ISCA? All that good stuff. Sure. My name is Ditu Rajaraman, and I am a board-certified behavior analyst, and I'm now a, an assistant professor of psychology at uh, UMBC in Baltimore, Maryland. Nice. And I actually got my training up near you, folks, at the New England Center for Children in Southboro, Massachusetts which is where I did a master in special education. And then I got kind of my certification. I took my coursework to sit for the BCBA exam. And that's where I really kind of got trained on behavior analysis and on applying behavior analysis to assess and treat severe problem behavior. And while I was out in, there's a satellite campus, I think that you've had guests on before who've spoken about this, but I was out in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates for a year. Mm -hmm. And that was the year, I think, that Dr. Hanley published the paper where they initially described kind of the comprehensive process related to the ISCA and the skill-based treatment. And Dr. Hanley was actually visiting and I was very intrigued and excited to go attend his, I think it was a three or four hour talk just describing this process and some of the outcomes because I had been working with kids with pretty severe challenging behavior throughout my time at the New England Center. But this something about this process sounded different. And I should readily admit that my first few years when I was at the New England Center, I did not take any academic coursework in behavior analysis. So a lot of the concepts were really foreign to me. However, I did kind of see the power of thinking about behavior in the context of reinforcement. And I saw the power of using procedures that kind of leverage that understanding to change behavior. But something about this Hanley paper sounded different. So I was super eager to go attend this talk. And then I was soundly not invited to that talk because it was for, <laughs> it was for BCBAs or, oh. or prospective BCBAs only. And at that point, I was a special educator. Mm-hmm. So I, I remember those days. Know, they're, 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 they're <laughs> it was a little frustrating there. I, you know. <laughs> yeah, just kind of banging on the door like, let me in, let me in. And I, I actually did for a brief period of time. I took like a research hour and I sat outside the door just listening in for a bit because this stuff was was just so intriguing to me. Some of this content and some of these thoughts surrounding synthesis and a different approach to assessing and treating problem behavior. But nevertheless, I got to reading and I was fortunate that somebody uploaded a video of Dr. Hanley's full presentation. And, you know, by function of just being really excited about it, and then I did have some face-to-face interactions with Dr. Hanley, he was generous enough to let 
some nobody like me come sit in on his research meetings. And I just came and sat and I just started collecting some data. And as by virtue of being there and just being trying to be a good citizen, I got to start running some of these processes. And that was really where my professional career as a, from a research perspective, where that started. So from there, I went on and I studied at Western New England University. I did my doctoral training under Dr. Hanley. And I did that. I left the New England Center and I went over to the university campus where I, for my day job, I taught undergraduate psychology and then did some research on the ISCA, skill-based treatment, some stuff related to caregiver training. And that was, that's sort of my story. I'm sticking with it. I mean, I just recently finished up that doctorate and now I'm down here and I'm interested in trying to pursue some more research in a similar vein. I don't think I knew that, did you, that you had, you kind of had come around to the idea of the behavior assessment a little bit backwards. Kind of for us, the ISCA wasn't a thing. You know, we learned to do your standard analog functional analysis. You learned to do the boring ass descriptive assessment. It's not boring. Uh, I think it's a little tiny bit boring. (laughs) I've come around. I've found some clever ones that I'm quite fond of, but, but that's not this episode where, you know, the ISCA sort of became the new technology, whereas it sounds like that was one of your introductory research pieces there was looking at at the idea of synthesis as part of the behavior assessment process. It's very cool. Yeah. And I like the way that you said kind of it was through the back door in a sense, because it wasn't that I was entirely unfamiliar with the fact that these other procedures, descriptive assessments, Mm -hmm. indirect assessments, and the treatments that were informed from those assessments, it wasn't like I didn't know that that was based off of research. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't familiar with the research. And when I was seeing it in practice, especially early in my training in New England Center, it was somewhat different disjointed. That is, especially if if we were conducting functional analyses with some of our, you know, tougher customers, these analyses would be carried out over a relatively long period of time. And then the information would get discussed kind of in one meeting. And then kind of a few weeks later, if we were lucky, we'd have kind of a treatment protocol based off of that. Mm -hmm. So I think that I was truly witnessing something that did exist in the literature, but I was seeing it in this Hamley paper that you just, you conduct the assessment on one day and then day two, that treatment just starts informed by the findings of that assessment. So I think that it was partially my own ignorance that led me to be as wowed by the process as I was. You can be wowed by behavior analysis. It's okay. We all are sometimes. No, no shame in that. I think that's a good thing. No shame here. Looking back, but maybe some shame throughout the the, the process. I mean, I know we're going to talk about this more, but I think that What you're bringing up is a really important point, and it's a point that I try to make to my students as well, because they talk about, you know, running a functional analysis and that they've been running one for a long time, sometimes with their their clients. And I say, well, at the end of the day, guys, like FA, even though we're holding this as a gold standard in our field, it's just an assessment, right? All of these different avenues that we're going to take are just assessment. As long as we're in this assessment phase, we are not in the treatment phase, And that means that we're not actually, while we're in the process towards delivering, you know, best practice services to our clients, we're not currently doing that because we're not actually producing change for their behavior. So the quicker we can get out of this assessment phase and into the treatment phase that's informed by our assessment, the better off we are all going to be. So, you know, regardless of the avenue to get there, I think being able to expeditiously move through the assessment process is really important. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with everything you just said. And I think that one of the barriers from moving on from assessment to treatment quickly was the fact that there has always been this sort of buffet of options. Like, okay, now that we've completed this functional analysis and we now understand that this particular problem behavior is maintained by this function, we would then have to take some time to say, okay, what's our next step? Mm -hmm. So that's another, I think, thing that stood out to me was, oh, the next step is pretty clear. Once you complete an ISCA, you start skill-based treatment and it's just in the exact same kind of procedure, but you're just kind of differentially reinforcing different behavior. Mm. And again, like I'm saying, that exists in the literature with FCT, with all sorts of behavior programs. But before, I think that we spent a lot of time in the choosing and planning process. And I was struck by the efficiency of this newer process, if you will. Very true. Well, before we get into a little more detail about the ISCA procedure and the IS- and then the treatment that is typically derived from the results of the assessment, let's talk about the articles that we'll be discussing tonight. The first is entry about the interview informed synthesized contingency analysis in the Encyclopedia of Autism Spectrum Disorders by our very special guests and by Dr. Greg Hanley. 
And that was 1990. Uh, no, it's not 1998. 2018. <laughs> Sorry. Whoa. <laughs> it's a back to the future scenario there. Run back in time. D2 is in like fifth grade. <laughs> I don't want to know what my writing would have looked like in 1998. <laughs> okay, here we go. Producing meaningful improvements in problem behavior of children with autism via synthesized analyses and treatments by Handley, Jin, Vanslow, and Henratty from the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis 2014, then achieving socially significant reductions in problem behavior following the interview informed synthesized contingency analysis, a summary of 25 outpatient applications by Jessel, Ingverson, Metris, Kirk, and Whipple from the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis 2018, and also from JABA in 2018, Nature and Scope of Synthesis in Functional Analysis and Treatment of Problem Behavior by Slayton and Hanley. Ooh. And those all, if you've already read them or you're like, oh, I better pick those up after I listen to this episode, they are some meaty, meaty research articles. You know, it's everything you wanted to know about the ISCA, but we're afraid to ask as well. So. <laughs> that's the subtitle. That's it. Yeah. Those tomes. That's, <laughs> they were pretty long, you know, they were, <laughs> it was very interesting stuff and it, and it even gave me new things. And I, I thought I'd read all the ISCA articles and nope, hadn't read those. I learned a lot of new things, but they're, they're big nice. ones. Like a densely packed meatloaf of articles <laughs> like a well-seasoned chili <laughs> oh yeah there you go all right so i guess we should probably start at the beginning as where the isca sort of developed from and i think all of us have done the analog functional analysis and i think we all know that it, like we've been talking about can take a long time and i think we've probably all either heard at talks or we've seen in the research when there have been surveys of how are behavior analysts using functional analyses in determining their treatment, the percentage of practitioners who actually say, I always do a functional analysis is scarily low. I think it's, you know, definitely it was less than half, I think, you know, mm -hmm. consistently use a functional analysis before developing treatment. You know, it's one thing to be like, well, like everyone has forgets or they have that case where they think they know what's going on from a couple observations and they sort of just jump ahead and everyone does that every now and again. But when you have that systemic sort of, no, I don't really do that. And I'm going to say that anonymous survey, <laughs> I'm going to be mm -hmm. honest about it. That's very concerning because without function-based treatments, really anyone could do our jobs because it's just, you know, pick from the bag of possible treatment options and throw them at the child and maybe one of them will work. You know, that, that's sort of our thing. So it's kind of disappointing that it isn't the thing that people are doing consistently. You know, that there are also problems, I think, even in like, you know, there's a the Hagopian study that was cited in a lot of these, where even when you have the consistent usage of sort of the analysis assessments that we have, you still would get treatment successes that weren't as high as you'd expect. You know, you think of, I do this whole analysis, it should be 100% success. And you weren't seeing those percentages, or at least you're not seeing that it is reported in the research. So the idea of having an assessment that is quicker and that results in a high hit rate in terms of treatment to decrease, high decrease uh, in percentage of problem behavior is really very alluring for everyone, not just the behavior analysts out there. And certainly the idea of synthesizing reinforcers is not brand new. You know, the idea of, well, I've got my four standard conditions. I got my loan and my tangible. I've got my control. I've got my attention. I've got my demand. And because of some idiosyncratic component of the student or client's life, I'm going to move things around a little bit. I'm going to change some of the variables in this assessment to get better outcomes. So kind of going to the logical conclusion of just having an assessment where that's all you do, it, you know, makes perfect sense when you think about it. D2, how do you describe sort of the process of coming up with an ISCA, running an ISCA? Sure. Thanks for saying all that stuff. I just wanted to add on to one thing you mentioned. Oh, you said do. that the, the notion of, of a quicker process that has a higher likelihood of treatment effectiveness is very alluring. And if I could just add one thing, I would also say that safety is probably a really important factor in all of this. Mm -hmm. I want to say that that was explicitly written about in at least one of the two survey studies where practitioners were saying they weren't doing too many functional analyses, yeah. but mm -hmm. functional analysis is traditionally correlated with a relatively unsafe set of conditions because we're purposefully trying to evoke dangerous problem behavior. And I think it's worth noting that a lot of these procedures were developed and refined in some of these more well-resourced inpatient type settings or intensive outpatient settings. Mm -hmm. But maybe when we see that you're trying to implement it in the school, in the home or somewhere else, that that safety becomes much more of a pressing concern. It becomes much less tenable. 
So I just think that also coming up with a model that's not only quicker, but safer, where we're understanding more by evoking less problem behavior Mm -hmm. is a similarly important, if not the most important concern. Because, you know, you also, you said something about as behavior analysts, we should really be doing the analysis part of behavior analysis. And I I couldn't agree more, but I think that we're going to lose more and more favor in our interdisciplinary teams if we're the people that are associated with evoking the most dangerous problem behavior most of the time as well. So all that said, I can't emphasize enough the importance of moving towards a safer model where we're not necessarily evoking dangerous problem behavior. Mm -hmm. That's That's very true. Um, I think that is pretty well spelled out in the research on the ISC and sort of how one identifies the target behaviors and really looks at minimizing that that risk. And that's been in some of the other, you know, FA literature. I mean, right. I know the latency based FAs, a lot of that research was looking trial at trial based too. FAs. Yeah, trial based also, FAs too. You yeah. know, consider the severity of the behavior so it doesn't have to happen a ton. Mm-hmm. And one of these survey reports that we're referencing sort of tangentially is Oliver Pratt and Normand, 2015 in Java, a survey of functional behavior assessment methods used by behavior analysts in practice. To just briefly summarize, they reported that 16% of BCBAs said that they never used a functional assessment method and that 48% of them said that they almost never used a functional assessment method. So that's a little bit scary. And then the barriers to functional analysis that they mentioned were lack of time, lack of space and materials, difficulty with administrative policies allowing for an FA to occur, Mm -hmm. lack of staff and that they felt that they were not necessary <gasps> or useful. I Tell your student <laughs> loan officer that they're not so, necessary and useful. No, <laughs> I, I can see how that would happen, though, right? Because when you're thinking about functional analysis methodology, a lot of times, even in the earlier part of this decade, they were only learning about the IWATA standard FA, right? So given the, I know the IWATA standard FA is amazing and it is, has helped many, many people, but there are, you know, depending on the situation, better ways. So I think a lot of the practitioners that are answering this survey may not have been keeping up to date in the literature, and they may not know about the trial-based FA. They may not know Mm -hmm. about the latency-based FA. They may not even have heard about the ISCA, right? So I think that is one of the major problems, I think. Not necessarily that FAs are dangerous, because they don't have to be, but that it is hard for our field to keep up to date with the literature, just because of, you know, like, hashtag life. Like, it's yeah. it's tough. Well, even with, like, the ISCA, you know, but right before we started recording, we were talking about, I know, we, we should, we definitely have to make sure we go over the procedure, because I think anytime I'm talking with anyone about the ISCA, I'm, you know, reading the, the research to prep for this episode, is a lot of, like, yep, know this, know this. I've seen Dr. Hanley talk a bunch of times. I've been running a number of ISCAs. I've had a lot of practitioners talk about it. It's it's the topic at every single conference around here, at least part of it, is, you know, oh, what's, what's the new assessment? But that's not always going to be the case, you know, for everyone. I mean, part of the reason for the show is that it's hard to synthesize all the research out there, you know, everywhere in the world. So sometimes it's nice to be able to just kind of go back and review and put it all together because, yes, not everyone's going to know that there are all those options or they'll know there's two or three, but not that there are more than that or that there are ways that they could make, you know, the concerns about safety, concerns about time, concerns about resources less of a problem. Well, anyway, so there's a lot of preamble, but we should probably just talk about the procedure, right? Let's do it. <laughs> All, All right. right, let's get into it. That was fun. I'm excited already. I just wanted to throw that out there. I'm having oh, a great time. That's great. Good, good, good. <laughs> so broadly speaking, the question is just how do you go about conducting an ISCA? What's an ISCA? ISCA stands for Interview Informed Synthesized Contingency Analysis. It is a functional analysis that wherein the contingency that is manipulated across conditions is entirely informed from an interview with relevant caregivers, usually parents or teachers or school personnel. So the ISCA is a functional analysis. It is informed by an interview, which is we consider an indirect assessment. Mm -hmm. We like to say that though together the interview and the ISCA comprise what we call the practical functional assessment or PFA process. So many acronyms so, did <laughs> yeah, maybe I should have started there. So the PFA process <laughs> is a complementary functional assessment process wherein one assessment informs the other. Okay, so it starts off with an interview with relevant caregivers. And really uh, what that interview is, is just trying to identify the conditions to be tested in an analysis. Sometimes when we ask people like, hey, what's the purpose of interviewing folks? They'll say, oh, it's to identify the function. And I think that's a little premature. Rather, the goals of that interview are truly to be able to understand 
Three things. Thing number one is what are dangerous topographies and what are all of the associated non-dangerous topographies that are reported to or that historically Mm co-occur? So it's not just what's the complaint, self-injury or or dangerous aggression, but also what are some of the signs that those more dangerous forms are impending or forthcoming? And what are some of the kind of lower intensity problem behaviors that tend to come along for the ride? I'll come back to why I think that's, that's really important in a minute. Thing number two is what are all of the suspected or potential establishing operations for these episodes of problem behavior? What are all the triggers, any types of events, and especially those that tend to, again, co-occur that turn on the problem behavior? And then finally, it's what are all the suspected reinforcers? And we often ask that in the context of, especially with parents, like what are all the things that ultimately turn behavior off that ultimately resolve the problem behavior episode. So the main mission of the interview is to identify those three things so that one can go and conduct an analysis using all that information. So once we identify all those things and we hear, I'll just quickly say that we're usually able to hear those stories. And typically when we talk to parents and teachers, we do find that they nominate more than one event in each of those two categories with respect to the establishing operations and the reinforcers. Mm -hmm. Taking all that information together, we design a synthesized contingency. So that typically just looks like, well, we start by just designing a reinforcement context. And that's all of the items, activities, materials, interactions that when presented would yield a really low likelihood of problem behavior for the child. Mm -hmm. So I guess as an easy example, you might imagine a kid who likes to have a whole bunch of toys. They like to have undivided attention from mom and dad, or we'll just say mom. And they like to have their unique requests kind of granted. And they don't like being told what to do. So we'd start with our reinforcement context, and that's what we call our control condition. And that's what child would just experience all of those reinforcers and really the, the absence of suspected establishing operations for a few minutes. Then when we design our contingency to be tested in the test condition, it really just starts off, that session will start off looking just like a control condition with all those reinforcers present. But then the programmed establishing operation simply involves programming all those events suspected to trigger problem behavior. So if there's a kiddo who doesn't like being told what to do, but they like all their stuff and uninvited attention, we might, in one synthesized event, we might start to take away some of those toys, divert some attention, stop complying with unique requests, and start presenting some type of demand-related activity. And the minute that we see any instance of problem behavior, and and this, this is why that first question about all the topographies of problem behavior is important, the minute that we see any of those forms emerge, we immediately reinforce, that is, we go back to that reinforcement context and we repeat that over and over. Usually, traditionally, it's done in, in five-minute increments. But however, it's been reported also in three-minute increments or 10-minute increments. I'm sorry, when I say increment, I mean sessions. Mm-hmm. So we do that in a test condition for about five minutes. And then sometimes we'll go back to a control condition and then we'll retest again. So, you know, at its heart, the ISCA, like I said, is a functional analysis. And the only thing that's really manipulated across the control and the test condition is the presence of the synthesized contingency. That is the programming of the establishing operation and then the contingent reinforcement of any form of problem behavior. Hey, Ditto. Yes. How many times do you get this correct? Right? Because it seems like having a lot of things in one condition could get challenging or maybe not. I don't know. I'm just asking. How many times like, does the first time that we conduct an analysis yeah. yield the ideal differentiation? Yeah. I think that in the reported literature that the hit rate for first time is somewhere between 70 and 80%. All right. Okay. Meaning that the first time that parents, just based off the information in the interview, and of course, it's, it's, it's worth mentioning that in the initial 2014 study that they also conducted like a structured observation in between the interview and the analysis. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that was just to sort of tease apart some of the things that might have been perhaps unclear in the interview or to just see how certain interactions would go before kind of implementing them in the analysis. But in later studies, and I want to say these days, that part's sort of been omitted from the traditional set of procedures in the practical functional assessment process. Yeah. Why um, do you think that is? It's a great question. The reason I think that is, is that it's directly relevant to the question of like, how often do we get it right? The process in all the reported studies, and definitely as we do it in practice, involves having those caregivers present during the analysis. So they are always there watching. And as soon as we see something that's not right, that is as soon as the behavior that we predicted 
the behavior patterns are not as we predicted. And we're immediately asking caregivers, like, what are we missing? Are we doing something differently? Are we doing something wrong, perhaps? And so that's another reason that we've really shifted towards calling this a practical functional assessment process is that it is not as though interview happens at time A, analysis happens at time B, and then that is like all that is to be done. When we are in an unsuccessful analysis, we are kind of actively interviewing, trying to understand if there's things about the story that parents or teachers told us that we were missing, that we're not emulating properly. Right. And so I think it's because of that, because we've really seen the success with kind of what we call follow-up or, or ongoing interviewing. We've seen that lead to differentiation. Therefore, we haven't needed to rely on sort of structured observation with kiddos. And then another reason is just because... When we have done it historically in the past, well, it's sort of this idea of where sometimes we're meeting these kiddos for the first time mm -hmm. and going into a room and then just to sort of understand how to poke, you know, how to poke the bear. It doesn't build a strong therapeutic relationship from the front end. Yes, in the analysis, you are programming a really powerful establishing operation, especially when parents tell you that these five things be guaranteed to set off, you know, problem behavior. But our analysis context is highly controlled. And sometimes during those structured observations, we have a little bit less control and the risk of kind of ruining the relationship before it even starts is, is perhaps not worth it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, that I, makes sense. but I think some of that, the idea of the rapport, isn't that the purpose of starting with the control is the idea that you get at least these five minutes where like, Hey buddy, here are all the things that unless your parents really have no idea about what you like, I'm probably going to spend the next five minutes doing everything you could ever want. Not yeah, that long though, in the grand scheme of life. Well, when you're, you're a young kid, you know, five minutes is a long time. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. It's not a long time, but we, you know, when we try to implement some of these things in schools, uh, day programs where the contingencies are really kind of confusing and unpredictable, it's great to start this process off with a great deal of predictability. Mm -hmm. So we're saying, okay, we're going to kind of do a pullout model where this child is maybe going to come to this other room and they're coming in there for the first time. And you're totally right. Five minutes is not a long time, but we'd rather start off with them wanting to come to the room again, as opposed to being like, come to this room where we're going to evoke yeah. a lot of problem behavior. Yeah. Well, the other piece too, you know, D2, that you mentioned is you're really just looking for either the first instance or the first link in the sort of problem behavior chain to re-deliver all of the reinforcers, you know, back to sort of, you know, remove any of the demands or, you know, remove any diverted attention, whatever it was for that student. So there aren't a lot of opportunities to engage in problem behavior compared to say, you know, when you think of the standard functional analysis and that, you know, if you know, the student has kind of builds up, so they start with flopping on the floor or they start with crying and then they start hitting or flopping on the floor. You know, you're not waiting for very much problem behavior to occur before, Hey, here's all the stuff I just took away and I'm getting rid of all the stuff that change the EOs in, in this situation. So I do think that's one of the other strengths of the assessment is that you're really not spending a lot of time waiting for, you know, for problem behavior to occur and then not spending a lot of time allowing problem behavior to occur. I mean, it's true on most FAs, but I think even more so for the ISCA, it just seems very, very brief to yeah. you know, allow those contingencies to, to shift. Yeah, it's a great point. I think that it speaks to the idea that if it's a well-designed analysis, that you really shouldn't see any flare-ups, that you should be able to quickly evoke problem behavior with the presentation of the synthesized establishing operation, quickly evoke a very mild form, and then you should be able to quickly turn that off immediately by presenting all of these reinforcers. And when we see that, when we re-deliver the reinforcement and the reinforcers, if you will, and the child is still acting out, we feel as though we've missed something, that mm -hmm. either we... You know, that it's either that there's still an EO operating for some reinforcer that we haven't controlled, or every once in a while we do see kind of this children kind of go into emotional responding where they, where they have a lot less control over that. And that sometimes happens when we wait too long to reinforce mm -hmm. as well. It's certainly not something that's unique to the ISCA. There's, there's been dozens of studies where they've especially and specifically examined kind of precursor behavior or right. co-occurring topographies. And there are also studies in the standard FA literature where they do that as well. But I think that it is a strength. It is certainly used across all ISCA studies, the reinforcement of lower, you know, lower intensity forms of problem behavior. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is a dissemination question or maybe it's a now question. But the one thing that I've always been hesitant about with the ISCA is new BCBAs running in ISCA because they might not be well-versed in interviewing 
and designing a, you know, a, a complex synthesized condition? Like, what would your recommendations be for that, right? Because I know that my students coming out of the program, I think they do fine, right? But that seems like a lot to do. Like, where do you think people should do these off the bat? That's a great question. I do want to give a quick shout out to, wasn't there a recent graduate from your program that published a study? Yes. On the ISCA? Yes, she did. What is this uh, Jordan. nepotism Way question? Go, Jordan. Jordan. That, I actually <laughs> forgot. Come on. Way to just hit right off the well, tee there, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I actually forgot that. So well, there's sorry. so many graduates publishing so much amazing research. It's hard to keep track. We, you know, it's we just, just so hard to keep track. We just, you know, but, we just we just pop out research there at Regis College <laughs> in Weston, Massachusetts, O two. <laughs> Nine four three or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really great study. It's uh, I think Jordan Choose It and Dr. Lauren Bullu is yeah. that right? Yeah, the authors. Mm -hmm. And sorry, Jordan Choose It Rose now. And the point I want to make is that we, we have seen young BCBAs, those that don't have their BCBA, we've seen all, all sorts of folks be successful with this process. And if the concern is that they may not be able to design the proper context, I think that's one thing. But when we consider success in the analysis. Question number one is, did things get dangerous? So it's to us, it's like so much more important that people experience a safe context, a safe experience. If we don't necessarily get differentiation, that's a follow-up question. And I think that new BCBAs are oftentimes very sensitive to this idea of I want to keep things safe, right? It's my first time doing an FA. Mm -hmm. I don't want people to think, especially if you imagine now they're the BCBA in charge of an entire school district. You know, they don't want to leave that room with everybody knowing that they were the person that was responsible for a major meltdown, mm -hmm. something of the sort. But furthermore, I do think all of these processes are much better done in a community than alone and learning from people who have had experience with the process, whether you're newly minted or, or a senior BCBA. But sometimes it's kind of the, the language game that we get kind of trapped into prevents us from just designing the context that we are actually hearing from parents and teachers. So what I mean by that is when we conduct an interview and parents are just using their everyday language to tell us a story, they say, oh, uh, I can't even think of an example, but it's, you know, when my kid has his schedule and if we deviate from the schedule, there's likely to be problem behavior. But if we do everything on a the schedule, there won't be problem behavior. That's not easily fitting into the box of attention or tangibles right. or escape. And what we have found, I guess, in working with newly minted BCBAs is that they're more comfortable being like, okay, cool. I guess this is the context that we're going to design is that reinforcement means we follow a schedule and test and, and EO means that we're going to interrupt his schedule. So I have just great faith and optimism and we've seen great success with folks with not so much training being successful with this process, especially when we emphasize some of the key components, which is, you know, number one is that safety component. But I think number two is the idea that the goal is not to necessarily identify function in terms of what are the things that we're going to call this contingency? What are we going to say is the function of problem behavior? But the goal is instead to control problem behavior by mm -hmm. turning it on quickly and then turning it off quickly, being able to repeat that and have that be a reliable effect as a function of the contingency that you design. Mm -hmm. okay. I have to say, did that answer the question? I think I yeah. deviated a you bit. Did. You did. Well, you did both. <laughs> you did and both. And that's okay. But did both. Great. That's why it's a podcast and not a symposium. You get to deviate a bit. I think for me, that was the distinction that helped me the most in initially wrapping my head around the ISCA, is that's the way I tend to think of it, is what is the condition that I could establish that is going to best demonstrate turning the behavior on and off? Mm-hmm. I think yeah. you actually, you told me that at, I think we were at some sort of a, at some sort of a function at, at a Babbitt or something. We and I think just eating at you, Panera. <laughs> you told, you just kind of told me that one time because I was sort of still, oh. I liked the concept, but eating. I kept coming back to, I don't think we were eating anything at the time. Oh. It, we kept coming back to the idea of like, you know, but what's the function? I have to find the fun, you know, thinking about it as like, which of the four boxes am I checking? WTF? And, what's and, the function? And you brought up that, you know, <laughs> no, it's, that's not exactly what it is. It's more about the, what are the conditions? Find the conditions. And then you've got your answer because now you know what is going to be the treatment that results in low rates of problem behavior as well as appropriate skill acquisition. I have something again. So let's say that you've run your ISCA and you've developed treatment quickly. But what if that treatment stops working after a week because you haven't necessarily identified function, right? And then what do you do then? Has that happened before? 
So I wanted to make a quick aside, and I'll I'll say it first because I think it might help answer this question. Sure, thank you. I'm I not being a Debbie Downer. I really am not. No, it's a, it's a really good question. Okay. And we the, invite the, you to I, come on the show, Jackie, and you're just <laughs> attack, attack, attack. <laughs> he knows I love him. This is, this, this is fun. It's good stuff, and it's really important to discuss. But I think that there is this, we were saying that perhaps there's a traditional way of thinking that we need to understand what is the function. And perhaps the ISCA doesn't achieve that. Rather, they can, you control behavior by demonstrating it turns on when and only when you want it to. But I think that perhaps if there's a language game that's happening that's slipping, it's that the definition of a functional relation, as it's historically been written about in behavior analysis, involves two things. One is the you know effect that behavior has on the environment. And I think that's more closely tied to our traditional notion of what is the function, like what is the purpose mm-hmm. of the behavior in the environment, if you will. But that second thing is this notion of a mathematical functional relation, like the change in the measure of one variable as a presence or absence of another variable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? That is entirely demonstrated with the ISCA in that the only thing that changes across conditions is one thing. It's the presence or absence of a contingency. So some people kind of take issue with the ISCA because they're saying that's not a functional relation. You're just kind of throwing stuff, just throwing a bunch of variables at behavior and and that's all that happens. But we now have some demonstrations in the literature where Dr. Jessel and some of his colleagues have shown some within session data patterns that show some really precise control. That is that the behavior truly only turns on in the seconds following the establishing operation and remains off for any period of time when reinforcements programmed. So we'd like to talk about that as strong control. And when we have that in place, and we conduct treatment, we do see really great effects with that. Now, there are obviously times when out in reinforcement thinning and, or, or when we p- present perhaps novel EOs that things start to fall apart. But from a look at the literature and as well as what we see kind of in practice, this method leads, yields, I guess, successful treatment outcomes. And if it doesn't, it's not as though finding out a more precise function has gotten us to that promised land. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that's the point I want to make is that I think in every FA paper that's been written, there's at least a line that says treatments are better when they're informed by an FA than not. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think that it's from that language or, or, you know, from those studies that have shown that those treatment utility studies showing the comparative effectiveness of the FA that we have taken away this idea that knowing the precise function is what yields the better treatment outcomes. But I think if the narrative is shifting in any direction with some of this ISCA literature, it's that perhaps it's achieving strong control over behavior is what yields treatment effectiveness. But these are, I guess, questions that are going to continue to be answered in the literature Mm -hmm. in the coming years. I don't think I sufficiently addressed, were you asking more of a procedural question? Like, what do you do when treatment? No, I think you are okay. You gave me something to think about (laughs) as we continue the discussion. (laughs) You did. And you answered the follow-up question that I was probably going to bring up, which was, what if in doing a synthesized contingency, you sort of accidentally lump in an additional function that is just a false positive? But what you're saying is that in the literature, they've determined that you're not necessarily doing any harm by including that if in the overall contingency, you've got the pieces that you need in order to then move on to effective treatment. Yeah, I think false positive is a great one to talk about. It's one that brings people a lot of pause, the possibility yeah. that there may be a false positive. However, as far as we've seen in the treatment studies where they've actually done treatment with the potential of there being a false positive reinforcer in there, it's simply just not consumed during the reinforcement interval. That is, if we have attention and tangibles during reinforcement and the child may only be playing with their iPad However, that doesn't necessarily, A, it doesn't rule out the relevance of the attention per se, but B, we haven't seen it yield any kind of problems. It still leads to effective treatment. So yeah, I'm with you there. Mm -hmm. We're going to come back with some more about the ISCA, including the treatment for right after the ISCA is done. But let's take a little break in between that, shall we? We'll be right back. CBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Masters of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Masters of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master's certificate. 
You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu, regiscollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. And we are back with our special guest, Dr. Adityan Rajaraman, talking about the ISCA. But before we get into any more conversation, why don't we share some exciting news? ABA Inside Track is ACE approved. By listening to the show, you are able to earn continuing education credits. Hooray! All you need to do is listen to the episode and go to abainsidetrack.com slash get hyphen C-E-U-S, C-E-U-S, and then enter in the secret code words for this episode. The first code word is Firefly. F-I-R-E-F-L-Y. Like the bug that you put in a mason jar. And oh, it's so beautiful. And don't you remember all your great summers in your camp? Remember that? Remember how great that felt? And then they die in the jar. Or remember that hit TV show, Firefly, that wasn't a hit, but it was one of everyone's favorite sci-fi shows. Been. And now it's canceled. And you're never going to see that again. Oh. I Love never saw Nathan that. Billion. Oh, it's great. Most people didn't see Firefly. Great show. And a code word, Firefly. And now back to the conversation. Well, let's move into that effective treatment. So you've done your ISCA. You know your sort of synthesized reinforcers. And then the treatment that comes out of the assessment is going to always look pretty similar because it's going to include the component of functional communication training and mm-hmm. then delay and denial training following that. But it's it's not quite that. It's not like, there you go. You know, those are, <laughs> I said two sentences. Could you go into more, more detail as to <laughs> exactly <laughs> what the treatment entails? It oh. really is an easy assessment. Wow. <laughs> I wish it were just as easy as two sentences, <laughs> but I'm trying my best. I mean, I think that as we've said a couple of times over, it's all predicated on identifying that really motivating context in which to teach skills. And when we've shown that given a certain set of events, that problem paper will turn on right away. I think that we have evidence that the child is supremely motivated in that context. And when we've shown that we can turn that behavior off time and time again, we have evidence that this synthesized reinforcer is sufficient to keep things safe and is that which the child is motivated for, I guess. So all we do is once we have that baseline context, we're just shaping a different repertoire to go in between that programmed establishing operation and those programmed reinforcers. So day one of treatment is often called simple functional communication training. We teach kind of the lowest, a response that is highly doable in the repertoire of the child. It exists perhaps, it might be a little novel, but if they are non-vocal, we wouldn't expect them to say something. We would use a sign, we would use a, a button press. Low effort response is kind of what I'm saying. Mm. And we prompt and differentially reinforce that low effort response in the presence of that synthesized establishing operation. And then we provide full synthesized reinforcement upon emission of that response. So it's kind of standard functional communication training, just that the EOs might be more than one and that the reinforcers might be more than one. Mm -hmm. And there's various ways to kind of go about prompting as there are with other FCT and, and other types of teaching studies. But typically, I will say one of the more recent discoveries that's soon to be published in the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis is this idea that during functional communication training, if problem behavior occurs, we also will immediately present a prompt. So let me, sorry, let me back up a bit. Mm -hmm. If in the traditional teaching process, we typically like to go with most to least prompting. That is the first time that we program that establishing operation. We say, hey, just say more time or just say my way. And as soon as the child emits that skill, we say, oh, of course, you can have all these reinforcers for free. Some kids are highly reactive to those EOs and, and they end up just as soon as you even start going for it, as soon as you even start saying, OK, we're all done playing. Right. They start to engage in a whole burst of problem behavior. And there's long been this sort of this hint in the literature that if you prompt following problem behavior, that that might lead to more problems. But my colleague, Dr. Robin Landa, will be publishing a study showing that if problem behavior is to occur in that moment, that you can provide a sort of a secondary prompt immediately following problem behavior. 
and it doesn't appear to have too many negative effects. That is, it will still help teach the FCR at the exclusion of problem behavior. Yeah, um, to so, read that one. Yeah. I know. It was a neat study, and there were a couple of different comparisons that they did across different types of prompting. But I think the take-home point, and I hope that I'm characterizing it accurately, is that immediate prompting following problem behavior did, was okay, that it still led to successful treatment in that phase. Another little detail that I'll mention in the simple FCT that might be helpful to consider is that when we notice that if we put in this entire, this full synthesized establishing operation, that is we take all the stuff away, divert all our attention and gives the hardest demands. If we notice that that's evoking problem behavior so quickly that the child isn't taking the prompt, that in treatment, we might present a gentler establishing operation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we might, you know, so that the heat's not all there, teach the skill, <laughs> reinforce that skill. And then within the simple phase, but you, more generally in later phases in complex functional communication training or even in toleration training, that's when we'll start to reintroduce the full heat of the, the full synthesis of the establishing operation. And that's been shown to be really helpful, especially because that first step is really about a quick elimination of problem behavior and just replacing it with an alternative response. Mm -hmm. I have another aside. So when you're talking about this quick elimination of problem behavior, are you talking within the context of sessions or would you recommend that this happens throughout the entire day? Ooh, this is a big question that I love. <laughs> and I think that... <laughs> I'm so big so, with my questions. <laughs> I think one of the big differences between, I'm like, here's a little story, but it's not really a little story. But when I did move, transition from working at the New England Center for Children to the outpatient clinic in Springfield, I noticed that not only was there a lot of stuff different about the types of kids that we were working with at the New England Center for Children, there were some, well, I was working with older kids, adolescents with really long histories of severe problem behavior. Whereas at this outpatient clinic, I was working with some younger kids. But I also noticed that the treatment model was really different. That is, at the New England Center for Children, when we'd complete an assessment, the next plan was sort of often was to roll out a behavior plan across the day mm -hmm. informed by the findings of an assessment. Does that register? Does that sound? Yeah. When you've got that many employees who are also in graduate programs, you would hope that you can you know, roll a lot of the basic procedures out pretty quickly. So, yes, that tended to be the, the model. Yeah, exactly. There's so many reasons why, why it needed to be the model. And by contrast, in this outpatient clinic, we were bringing kids in for three one-hour visits a week. And it was only during that time that they were experiencing these contingencies that we were hyper-programming, that we were trying to get really strong stimulus control over their behavior. And during those other times, we would encourage parents to do one of two things, either just do business as usual. If the behavior is severe, but you're managing, we'd just say, keep living the way you're living. Or we'd say, just try to your best to kind of keep problem behavior at bay by providing all these reinforcers as much as possible. Right. Mm -hmm. Just eliminate the so ego. Yeah. Yeah. Try, yeah, exactly. Try to make sure that there's no reason for them to do this just by giving them everything for free. And so I have since tried this across so many different models and so many different dosages. But I think one of the take-home points is that it's really important in the teaching process to have a strongly distinct, a highly salient context. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't necessarily mean that they need to come from home to an outpatient clinic. Like I think that they can be in a school and go to another room or perhaps even just go to another side of the room or perhaps just have a analyst wearing a bandana mm -hmm. or something of the sort to signal that when, I'm, when this bandana is on, we're playing by these rules. And so the question is like, are we trying to go for quick elimination of problem behavior? I'm talking about quick elimination of problem behavior under these rules, you know, when the bandana is on or when they're in the treatment room. Yeah. And the main reason I say that is because we've found, again, with this strong control of, of problem behavior that we can really develop a really robust repertoire of replacement skills, not just communication, but some of the stuff we'll talk about in a minute, toleration skills and then cooperation skills that can then be stretched out into more and more contexts. Mm -hmm. So kind of getting that initial control in one context in an initial context is supremely important. So that's all I'm saying. I'm saying when we're in FCT and we see elimination, we usually see it within the first two or three sessions that they take the prompt because we try to make it something that they're, that they'd be really likely to engage in and that problem behavior goes away. Mm -hmm. That does not mean that they will leave the room and then be cured if you will, but we do <laughs> provide <laughs> we right, do provide yep. parents with, you know, whatever suggestions we can think of to minimize escalation. 
So do you're... you give parents bandanas too? We... <laughs> <laughs> At some point, yeah, if we want it. It's got like some Western New England university <laughs> swag, you know, branding on it. Axel Rose style. <laughs> oh, like those kind of. Oh, sweet ditto of mine. <laughs> yeah, I just went there. <sighs> so got okay, our so simple FCR. Simple FCR, which could be my way, but it could be something else, right? Yeah, it's going to be specific. Yes. It's whatever the context yes. the appropriate context yeah and and the I only thing my I, way is kind of the dumping ground fcr phrase of like <laughs> you seem like you want a lot of ground. random stuff kids so uh how about my way random but highly personalized yeah. highly individualized <laughs> you sure are idiosyncratic <laughs> young person how about my yes. way yes child with unique interests here <laughs> have all these unique things are there other common omnibus mans that you've used a lot of times, it's we do use my way. That's a pretty popular one. Sometimes we they'll, we'll teach them to say more time. When we've been working with some kind of older kids out in public schools and stuff, we've asked them if there's a phrase that they'd like. And one of my favorites is there was a kiddo, a young man who said, "Can I just do my thing?" Nice. And we were like, <laughs> "Yeah, bud, you can yeah. do your thing." So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of course you can do your thing. So maybe some things like that, but yeah, I have seen get get self conscious. They're like, "What if I just gave you like a baseball signal?" And I'm like, "What? Do whatever you want it to be. That's fine. We'll do that." The, no. I was going to say the topography, especially at simple FCT, is not incredibly important, but it provides a demonstration that the reinforcers are working the way that they're supposed to. That you can eliminate problem behavior, and then it allows you know it takes the heat out of that context where they might be excited to come back the next day. Because they're so darn effective in that room. Yeah. And then we can start shaping some um, a much more complex uh, repertoire. Mm -hmm. So you've got your, you increase your complexity, you're adding your pleases, your framed FCR, excuse me, please, all that good stuff. And at some point you get into what must eventually happen with any FCR, which is, okay, so this isn't going to work all the time. <laughs> How are you going to respond to that young person? So could you talk more about that step? I think, you know, talking about FCR and teaching kids to hear the word no, that's in you know various points in the literature, but at least as it relates to the treatment following the ISCA. Sure. Yeah. So typically by the end of complex functional communication training, the child is experiencing the full brunt of the synthesized establishing operation. And then they're engaging in a very polite, you know, slowed down man that is being reinforced 100% of the time. And usually at the start of tolerance response training or somewhere along in complex functional communication training, we move over to sessions that are broken down by trials. Mm -hmm. And I only say that because we're going to start talking about a couple of ratios that might be important. Mm -hmm. But typically when we're about to embark on denying certain mans, we will run about five trials a session. And so uh, each trial is essentially one interruption of reinforcement and then whatever the required response is and the trial ends when the child is then returned to reinforcement. Does that make sense? Yep, yep. So basically, if in a complex FCT, a five trial session would be five times of them saying, excuse me, can I please do my thing? And us saying, yeah, of course. So once we get to tolerance response training, we start off relatively systematically and slow and essentially the first session of talent response training might look a lot like the last session of complex fct mm -hmm. however maybe on that fifth trial when they say can i do my thing we'll say not now buddy we'll immediately prompt them to say something like that's cool or no problem or okay and as soon as they emit that what we call tolerance response we then hit them with the exact same synthesized reinforcement Mm -hmm. that we were using to teach the FCR across the previous phases. Do you phrase that differently to the student? like, Or is it just immediately they say, okay, they put their hands down, whatever the response is, I understand. And then immediately you just go back and deliver the reinforcement? Or is there? do you ever cue like, wow, you're so flexible, I'm going to give it to you anyway? Or oh, how does that usually look? I think that there's a great deal of variance across people that have done this. But generally, yeah, we'll try to differentially reinforce and differentially praise the thing that they're doing in the moment. Okay. So if they're just saying the the FCR will say, of course, thanks for asking. You can have it. Mm -hmm. But then if they're saying, you know, Oh, that's cool with me. We'll be like, Whoa, you are super flexible today. Sure. Why don't we play for a little bit longer? You know, okay. something along those lines, or we might go, you know what? On second thought, you're killing it. We don't need to 
keep doing other stuff. You can oh, have good. Okay, because that's that's how I've usually done it. And I know when I explain it to people that way, like other professionals who aren't behavior analysts, I feel like they really love hearing that description. Like, what a fun activity we're going to engage in. Like, they find <laughs> the treatment reinforcing. Like, oh, that's a great idea. How that's going to work? Like, it, it just makes sense. It just sort of goes with a lot of language that you hear in the school setting. You know about kids being yeah. flexible and kids handling change. Everyone loves when kids can handle change. It's the best thing that could ever happen, it seems. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that there's a small amount of nuance, but there are certain conditions under which we might need to start by using the exact same language every time. That mm-hmm. is, we need to kind of make the discriminative stimulus abundantly clear. And we will say, toys are all done. And then they might emit the man and we will say, no, not now. You know, or we might just say no. And we might need to practice that a few times just to make sure that the skill is emerging, you know, and that problem paper is going down. Mm-hmm. But as soon as we can, and for some kids, we don't need to start off that rigid. We just like to throw a whole bunch of different denials at them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, on the other side of the coin, we like to throw a different bunch of language when we're reinforcing their appropriate behavior. Mm-hmm. Just like you're saying, I think it really does help create a more natural exchange. Sometimes when I share some of these videos of this process to people that aren't behavior analysts, they're kind of like, so they're, they're using, it's very robotic. Even though for us, it doesn't seem very robotic. We try to make it a little bit of a natural exchange, but it's really taught me to be much more flexible with my language when reinforcing and, and when denying and things of that sort. Yeah. All right. So you've got your, yeah. you've got your denial going on. You're denying every, I think, fifth response you started with in the example. And then you yeah, so that was, your, that, that would be, that would be the beginning of that phase. But by the end of that phase, we would expect at least that 60% of those trials, that is three of the five trials that they are appropriately tolerating that denial. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's basically tolerance response training in a nutshell. There's certain details that might be worth discussing, but I think that we've kind of covered them. Mm-hmm. There's some children that might have a difficult time discriminating. Children with perhaps with less language skills, they might have a difficult time discriminating between when you interrupt reinforcement, like you present that initial establishing operation, versus when you give a denial cue after they've communicated. So these are some of the bumps in the road that we've seen that kids are sort of saying the same. They're just manding twice in a row or something, but we're trying to get two discriminated operants in that context. But essentially all the stuff that we said matters. We try to make sure that the two types of responses are really distinct from one another from the purview of the child. So if they do have lower language, we might have them touch a button for the mand and we might have them do sign language for the tolerance response. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are even some kids with language where we might have them use words to record for their man, but then maybe do a sign language or something of the sort for the tolerance response, like a thumbs up, something like that, Mm -hmm. just to help facilitate differentiation, things along those lines. But by the end of this phase, they should basically be communicating upon every EO presentation, and then they should be successfully engaging in a tolerance response of some sort upon every denial. Mm. And then as you're extending the time... It seems like it's either going to be some sort of like a DRA based kind of thing where you're like, well, first we're going to do a couple things and then you get your my way or you get business as usual or sometimes like more like a DRO based where it's just like an extended period of time or increasingly extended period of time. Though I know I think it's even been in a lot of Dr. Hanley's research, you know, more kids seem to prefer getting something to do and then I get my thing rather than period vacuum where who knows what's going on and then i get my thing contingencies matter yeah contingencies matter so contingencies matter that's right yeah that's a, a study by dr mashtit kamagami in 2016 that kind of showed that these treatment processes were more effective and reduced problem behavior better when you gave kids something to do during the delay mm-hmm. and i think when you talk about the dro procedures used during delay i think that that was something that Uh, Dr. Jessel described in his 2018 paper, the one that Mm -hmm. has been assigned, but there's still sort of like some expectation of the child of some sort. I want to say, yes, there's a, we're waiting for a timer to go off. However, there's still, we've started to call these behaviors in the delay. We call them contextually appropriate behaviors. Mm -hmm. One, because it's somewhat descriptive, but two, because then we have this beautiful, acronym cab and we just say kids are just cabbing oh away gosh. you know they're doing cabs during the delay so they many got easy acronyms. cabs <laughs> they got hard cabs <laughs> so many acronyms there's a lot of acronyms i know so we'll, we could just stick with contextually appropriate behavior but essentially it's just cooperation and we put cab expectations in place so that kids can cooperate with them awesome is all i'm trying to say 
that last phase is really where we introduce the things that children weren't doing before, the, the goals that whatever parents or teachers tell us that they have for the children, especially related to problem behavior. Mm -hmm. So when they're like, he would never brush his teeth. The minute I even say, let's go up to the bathroom, he starts having problem behavior. And that's when we slowly start to shape cooperation with those types of expectations mm -hmm. following the denial and following their tolerance responding. Yeah. And then that you just kind of try to get back to where, you know, where, whatever the skill deficit is and, and try to improve the behavior in the, in the natural context. That's mostly w where that would come in after those, yeah. after that denial and, and delay training. Yeah. And I really appreciate that you call it a skill deficit because I think there's times where it's hard to disentangle whether or not the non-cooperation is because of problem behavior or because they don't know the skill. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm talking about? So I think that it's smart to treat all these situations as though there is a skill deficit when we're doing these cab chains, when we're trying to strengthen these cab chains. And by that, I mean, we like to start really slow because usually at this point in the process, they've experienced the good life for <laughs> the majority of the time, right? They're just, there's yeah. an occasional interruption. They just have to communicate an occasional denial. They just have to tolerate but this cab chaining phase is what we call it i think in the earlier studies it was called compliance chaining or response chaining yeah this is really where they start to experience less and less time and reinforcement and a much greater proportion of their sessions in the establishing operation doing the things that, that are expected of them so depending on the child we'll go super slowly so i mentioned earlier that there are some there's sometimes where we might make that EO very, very gentle in that initial simple FCT phase. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yep, yep. Like we might not put the whole EO in place. For some children, when we see that they have quick triggers to problem behavior, we might make it all the way out through denial, through tolerance response training, and we still haven't even presented the full strength of the EO yet. And the reason we do this is because when you think about some of the things that are part of establishing operation, they are sort of contextually appropriate behaviors that we can shape. Mm -hmm. So an example of that, classic example is a kid who has his iPad, but the minute you start to even go for the iPad, they'll start having severe problem behavior. If that is going to be an impediment to us teaching some of these skills, we might stick through our early parts of these treatment processes, functional communication training and tolerance response training. We may never touch the iPad. We'll just interrupt them, say, hey, but your iPad's all done. And that might be sufficiently evocative that they'll mm -hmm. still communicate and tolerate. Mm -hmm. And I'll be clear that if it's not sufficiently evocative, we will progress the EO. We'll go to the next step where we might put a hand on the iPad or something of the sort. <laughs> Slow, but, dramatic. I'm reaching. I, <laughs> I mean it. Here I come. <laughs> Slow, but very deliberate. And that is super important, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just let kids, you can't just keep giving little warning cues. However, for some kids, like just saying, all right, we're going to do work now when they still have their iPad in hand is evocative. They'll say, Oh, can I have more time with my iPad? We'll say, sure. Or we'll say, no, they'll say, that's cool. And only then we'll start with some really, 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 you, you'd imagine that they'd be really low key expectations, but we might say something like, take your hand off your iPad. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. I can't believe you did that. You can go back to reinforcement for a little while. We might say, pause that video. And we might say, put the iPad on the table. And at this point, I'm very comfortable assuming that that's the pace that we need to go with most learners, mm -hmm. unless the, the process clearly teaches us otherwise. That's one of those things where you won't see that kind of speed reflected in some of the earlier studies, but that's kind of one of the definitely current practices is all about this gentler approach mm -hmm. where in rather than yank stuff out of, you know, a child's hands, we're teaching them to be independently effective with terminating it, putting it down and then transitioning over to maybe a workspace or something like that. So, Dichu, I had a whole bunch of questions about directions of the ISCA, but you know what? I think we spent a good chunk of time describing the overall assessment and the follow-up treatment in a good amount of detail, which I hope for folks who either have only heard of the ISCA or have never implemented the ISCA is kind of been a nice overall thorough review. I felt it was, and even, you know, having read a lot of these articles before. So that was excellent. But in the interest of time, I think we have a couple like hot button issues we definitely have to go over. So I'm going to move us into dissemination station. Ooh. <laughs> it was such a fun ride, wasn't it? I heard you, you sounded so excited. <laughs> So I do think it's worth doing kind of a quick discussion of what are the big questions left to answer about the ISCA in the research and probably a good place for you to talk about the research and the work that you've done related to the ISCA. 
Sure. Oh boy. Yeah. So what are the, the questions remaining? I really think that some really important pressing questions are about scaling these processes up. How do we get them so that they can be applied in more places by more professionals and to help more and more children? So it's about kind of expanding the scope of the practice. I think that's a really important area for future research. Mm -hmm. And then I think if I can be so candid, I know, you know, because Dr. Hanley now he has this consulting group. Him and his colleagues are out and they're actively consulting on so many different cases and they're learning so much. I was I was a part time consultant with that group for a period of time. Mm -hmm. And we're learning so much from each experience with a new child. And, And we have this team effort. And we're going into different organizations and we're trying to build capacity within those organizations. And the process has really kind of just gotten away, meaning that there's so many things that they're doing nowadays that are not necessarily easily described in the, they're not readily apparent in the literature. Mm -hmm. And so some of the future research questions, I think, are really about understanding some of the underlying mechanisms that have been successful in some of the procedural modifications that are now working in practice. So a great example of that is sort of this thing I just mentioned where we aren't really putting in the full establishing operation until we get out to delay chaining or contextually appropriate behavior chaining. That's clearly something to be studied empirically, Mm -hmm. whether or not that will lead to safer, better, faster outcomes than perhaps a model where you present, you know, in those early phases, you present the full EO. Those are some questions that I think are interesting. And really one of the newer lines of research that I'm personally and and particularly excited about is how do we do these models in a way that will minimize escalation throughout the entire process. So while I was at that outpatient clinic, we had run into a couple of clients for whom the mere thought of kind of physical management procedures was kind of a a Mm non-starter. And the idea that we would bring children into a room and say, these are sessions we're doing and the door is closed was part of the problem. We had some kids with a lot of language that were highly oppositional. Mm -hmm. Our traditional process, it's not physical management isn't a crucial part of the process, but it is in there when you think about children who have behavior sensitive to escape. And when you're conducting escape extinction, perhaps in treatment, if they're non-cooperative, you might tell them, you might show them, and then you might quote unquote help them. Well, that helping them with some kids leads to sort of altercation, some physical management, physical intervention procedures. Yeah. And there's, you know, such great evidence behind the use of escape extinction when treating problem behavior. But there's, you know, a lot of settings where that's just a no-go, non-starter. That's something that we've been grappling with as a research and practice group. So we've been coming up with some models. One of the studies that I'm, I'm most excited about is right now it's kind of being prepared for submission to for publication mm-hmm. is a model where we embed that skill-based treatment that we talked about within what's called an enhanced choice model. Mm-hmm. And so basically, like I mentioned, there was a kiddo who came to our clinic but was trying to get out the whole time. He wasn't the behavior wasn't turned off. A lot of times, even when we're trying to identify that initial reinforcement context, it's not just about there being no problem behavior, but we think it's really important that children are happy, relaxed, and engaged. I mentioned we want the behavior to not be there, but we also want kids to be psyched about these reinforcers that they're consuming. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When we notice that some of these children were not so, they were unhappy, they were not relaxed, they were disengaged, we realized that part of the problem was that we were asking them to stay in a room In our clinic, we were able to do that, but not really that much so. And then in other settings, you truly can't just put kids in a room and make them stay there. It'll lead to severe escalation. Mm -hmm. So we developed a model. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit all over the place, but now I'm going to get back to it. We developed a model called the Enhanced Choice Model. Where kids come to to treatment and there's it's almost like a behind door number one, behind door number two, but and, and door number three. But door number one is typical treatment procedures, but with a couple of modifications. Door number two is essentially the same reinforcers that we're going to use in treatment, but they're available for free. Mm -hmm. So we call it like the hangout room. And then door number three isn't really a door. It's just the idea that they can leave at any point in time. No questions asked. They can just say, I'm all done with this. Mm -hmm. Essentially, what we're setting up is a concurrent chains arrangement. However, it's not a formal concurrent chains in that we're, we're making them commit to something and they have to stay in that space. The children are free to roam about practice context, hangout context, or leave at any point. And if they choose to come into that practice context, we do the process that we just talked about, but with some slight modifications. And, and really, the, the main one is that we no longer use that physical guidance 
during periods of non-cooperation. Mm-hmm. It's probably the primary one, but the second one is that we're a little bit more active, proactive and retro perspective about chatting with some of these kids. So most of the clients with whom we've done these processes are, are have a lot of language skills and we make the expectations very clear for them. We say, hey, but if you choose to come into the practice rooms today, we're going to work on X, Y, and Z skill. I'm going to do X EO and then you have to engage in Y behavior in order pr- to produce Z reinforcers. And we make that abundantly clear to these children. And then we also like might reflect with them after their day's visit, say, hey, you did really great with this new challenge. Tomorrow we might work on something new. So that's all part of the enhanced choice model. And then the, the final thing is that we offer them some level of choice when we're working on some of those contextually appropriate behaviors. We might say, hey, we're all done playing. We do have to do work now, but you can choose if you want to work on reading or math or you can clean up or you can do homework. So we're trying to kind of emulate what parents might be able to replicate in their homes as well. But anyway, we've done a study with that. We have five participants across two settings, and the data are just really phenomenal. For all five of the kids, despite having that ongoing choice to leave, they chose to stay in that practice context 96% of the time. And we got some really great socially validated outcomes with respect to their problem behavior. And then perhaps most importantly, we we saw almost zero instances of dangerous problem behavior throughout the entire process. That's excellent. What we think is that in adding this ongoing out, you always have an out. You can always go just take your reinforcers and hang out in another room, or you can just say, see you later. We think that in adding those and some of these other procedural details that we've sort of made the process as preferred as, as, uh, well, we made it a little bit more preferred and kids are coming in, choosing to participate, choosing to have EOs programmed, and then learning some great skills while they're doing it. So I guess that's what we've got to look forward to in the future. So I think the elephant in the room is going to be the controversy about the ISCA in the field of behavior analysis. So I wanted to share a couple of the pros that I read very clearly, very loud and clear in in the articles that you passed along and that I've seen in other research about the ISCA. And then I know, Diana and Jackie, you had some other kind of thoughts you wanted to share. I'm a little in the bag for the ISCA myself in terms of just it is an assessment that I have a lot of, I certainly have an easier time explaining to other professionals of like what's going to happen, what it's going to look like. Certainly the amount of time that it often takes to run an ISCA. I have a lot of administrators who, when you talk about, well, I'm going to pull this kid out for about, I don't know, anywhere from, you know, 12 to maybe 50 times for 10 minutes or so. And in these different sessions, it's, you know, parents and administrators sort of like, I don't know, that doesn't sound like it's going to be effective. But when it's like, it's going to take about 30 minutes, everyone's like, oh, sure, whatever. Sounds great. Awesome. Go to it. I'm sure it's going to be a great assessment. And certainly in the Jessel study, the mean duration of the analysis was 35.6 minutes. And that was across the 25 participants that he had in that study. There was a high percentage of differentiation, both in the Slayton and in the Jessel article, which, of course, I think you know, we're talking about BCBAs who don't have a lot of experience. Isn't it nice when you have those great control test graphs where control is zero and test is, you know, 20. And it just, it's so clear. Aha, we've got it. We have all the contingencies. You've solved it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) The reduction to problem behavior, at least in the Jessel study, was a 95% reduction across all those 25 participants, which, I mean, those are crazy good numbers. And then the total amount of therapy from start to end was anywhere from about 20 to 35 hours from the assessment all the way to the end of treatment. So not so, so tiny and insignificant amount of time, but still a very, I think, reasonable expectation. And again, those are only 25 participants. It's not like it's every student who's ever had any assessment done. And and there are definitely studies looking at more traditional analysis procedures of behavior that have had good results as well. But I think when looking at that, you really do have a nice summary of a really great assessment tool. You know, I guess promising. It's been been around long enough now that I I think promising seems a little too pejorative a term to use. (laughs) Pejorative. I know it sounds pejorative. Promising sounds nasty about everything. I think I don't want to use that term anymore. Anyway, so a lot of positive. Do you promise you won't use it anymore? I I mean, you know, it'll probably slip out occasionally. There are probably better terms I could think of. I'll get a thesaurus, you know. (laughs) <laughs> Some nice pros there. Any other ones that you think I missed, D2, in terms of... I mean, I, I, we talked about safety, I think, being a big one. Uh, it was mentioned in some of the articles, but they didn't have a percentage or, or amount of time. So I, I didn't put them in my little pros section notes. But that is definitely a big pro, is that you are, are typically looking at, like in your research, very low rates of dangerous problem behavior occurring. 
No, I think you nailed it. That was an exceptional summary. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> if I can add, at the end of your description of that Chessel 2018 study, you said it's, tw- it's only 25 demonstrations, and I agree. Obviously, that doesn't represent the world, but it is. I think it's worth noting that they used a, a consecutive controlled case series design mm-hmm. in that study, meaning that all the participants that were enrolled, the data were reported for all of them. So to me, I think that adds an extra note of confidence that 25 out of 25 of the enrolled participants had such strong outcomes. And they were all socially validated. So I look at that as a pro and it's kind of like it suggests that there's not just that these effects are possible, but that they're highly probable which is good news. And no, I think everything else is there. So, you know, some of these, the questions that we're going to continue to ask are really about how do we continue to make it more safe and more humane and more dignifying and more acceptable in a wider array of contexts. So I still think that some of these pros are are yet to be discovered, but I really appreciate your summary uh, of the process. And especially because you, you know, you based off your personal experience with it, that you've had success communicating with other people about it and showing them, you know, the effects of that process. That's great. Yeah. So Dan, I know you had, we we were talking before we started recording some thoughts you had. So I would love to hear those as well. I think part of it is just so many of us in this field are coming from a particular place with our training, right? And, and we arrive here as behavior analysts with the background that there are these four functions of behavior, right? And most of the time we can sort of break it down and distill it down and say, well, we're pretty sure that it's this, it's attention or it's escape, right? And I I think it's part of why people are sometimes wary of the ISCA is that perceived loss of getting that exact answer. Because we've been mm-hmm. taught that if you do a functional analysis, that at the end of it, you're going to have presumably an answer, right? It's attention or whatever it might be. <laughs> and I am not a good debater. I'm like the worst possible debater because I always just end up agreeing with the other side. So you don't have to out debate me in any way, but (laughs) (laughs) I would never try (laughs) for me. I guess it's trying to reconcile those two things that, well, life isn't, doesn't really work like that, right? There's always going to be synthesized contingencies in place because we are never behaving in a vacuum. You're always going to escape to something and those things that you're escaping to very often have the other components of the other FA conditions that we were sort of hoping to separate out. Right. But I guess if we just leave it at that and say, okay, well, the history is that it's escape to attention and an iPad, which is a very real scenario that, that individuals get is that sufficient. And I know that those are the conditions under which we see behavior turned on and off, but is there one piece of that, that if we were to see a new topography of behavior crop up, that it's more likely that that behavior is actually maintained by one kernel component of that, that's, you know, most salient or most valuable for that individual that would, that would then help us inform treatment or our options for treatment down the road. I think that's like a really good question because you're basically saying, is the question basically at what point might the lack of precision be problematic? Yeah. Yes. I just think that one of the ways in which the context that's created in the skill-based treatment is really strong is because we you're typically asking questions about all of the co-occurring problem behaviors. So you're trying to knock out all of these because it's assumed, you make the inferential leap that they're all maintained by the same contingency, or they're all influenced by the same contingency. So when we've done these processes, we typically don't, I mean, we're treating a whole bunch of different behaviors in the same context and a bunch of different responses. And we see them be suppressed or reduced when these contingencies are manipulated to teach and support skills in favor of them. I guess my response to that is that in this, at least in the published literature and in the way that we see these processes, we're not seeing that happen. Now, that doesn't mean, if you notice in the Jessel study, there were three kids for whom they had separate contexts. They did more than one context for that child. So there might be a case where a a child elopes and flops and that's maintained by some type of reinforcer that's different from when they're hitting and screaming and kicking. And so that might require multiple contexts, multiple training contexts. However, it's still doable. You know, it, it still all fits within the model. We haven't yet seen the precision of knowing one variable that's driving the bus 
to be required in order to produce really strong treatment effects. And that's some of the stuff that I think Jessica Slayton wrote about really nicely in her literature review are these notions that when they've done these direct comparisons, sometimes it, it appears as though the synthesized contingency is, is superfluous because you get differentiation in that isolated analysis. But when it comes down to treatment, there is not a single example where treatment based off of the isolated function went further or was more successful than treatment based off of a synthesized function. There are examples where treatment based off of an isolated function then required the addition of other variables in order to, to get desired treatment effects. But the opposite doesn't exist. So I guess I have yet to come into contact with, with that scenario where the, a new behavior crops up for which we'd need to do, we'd need to understand its precise function in order to treat it. I guess the real heart of my response is, is this idea that it all comes back to this identifying this like as powerful of a teaching context as you can, because when you achieve that really strong control over problem behavior, it's highly unlikely that new behavior would crop up because you're predicting when the outburst is going to happen. And then you're directly teaching some skills to go in place of it. I think the, the ISCA name is, you know, perhaps could be workshopped, but the practical functional <laughs> assessment name is so good to me because oh. every time I try to make an argument, I come back to that. Yeah. Right. And you it's do. like, the that's name? what practical functional assessment. Oh. That's what it's all about. Not the yes. Risk. Okay. The, Sorry. Yeah. Cause that's what it's all about. Right. It's mm -hmm. like, we're doing this because it works and it works quickly and we can move on to treatment and then we can address problems in the real environment in the real time with the real families like which is what it's all about you know so to me like that name and that summary mm -hmm. gets at the heart of why this is an effective method mm -hmm. that was not a con that was, that I, was I love that you know i don't know if it's a spoiler alert but that's sort of a rebranding that's actively happening yeah i think that we're, we're going to start to see it called the pfa process more and more in the literature mm -hmm. and the reason for that strong emphasis is to emphasize that it is a process and the, the value of pragmatism, I think, that's inherent in the process. So I, I like that. But you're so right because there are situations, I think you noted them in the Jessel paper, where the interview identifies only one function. It's obvious that that is possible and could occur under certain conditions. I just think that historically in research, we haven't been looking for these interactions as much as we've been trying to isolate. Yeah. And that makes so much sense from a perspective of, okay, we have this mystery, mysterious phenomenon, mm -hmm. self-injury. We need to isolate the variables and try to understand it. The science builds on itself. And I think that we're just now at a point where when we start to ask those questions, is there more than one variable? Time and time again, we hear the answers, yes. And here, here are all of them. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And to round out my, my bullet points, which this isn't a criticism of the ISCA necessarily, but I think that what we, what I worry about for our field is that the conversation or lack of conversation back and forth regarding the ISCA and like the classic FA is producing unnecessary controversy within our field. And that's not a criticism of you, <laughs> D2. No, <laughs> so, I, but like, I, uh, can we not all see the value in functional analysis as the larger umbrella term and how each of these methods can fit underneath an umbrella and that the, our, our end goal is helping our clients and getting there in a timely fashion with the tools needed to then produce effective treatment for them. And to me, that's the most important message that we need to be getting out to the BCBAs who are maybe nervous about doing a functional analysis of any type that is just get going on it <laughs> so that mm -hmm. you can get out of that assessment phase and into treatment phase. But I, and I'm sure that you agree with me here that I don't want to see this become something that's going to further confuse practitioners in our field and make them even more wary of attempting any type of functional analysis. Yeah, what's the point of developing more efficient and effective methods if they just scare people away from using them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or our discussion about them is anything but efficient. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm picking up everything you're putting down, Diana. I, yeah. I couldn't agree more. As a person that's, I haven't been around long enough to have too much stake in the game, I don't think. I think that there are some of the 
original contributors to the literature and, and they have so much writing on these various camps, whatever it is. And, and furthermore, some of them are actively researching with respect to one FA over another. Yeah. And from my perspective, I think that it makes a lot of sense for them to air out some of these issues. And I, we've seen some public forums like at ABAI a couple of years ago yeah. where those discussions were held. But for these later generations, especially for new BCBAs, to go into these things with polarizing views really does seem against the mission of, of our field yeah. and against sort of this general spirit of what behavior analysis has to offer. And I don't mean to get super dark, but I do follow some weird, uh, some, I, w- I won't say weird. I follow some niche groups on Facebook, Twitter, and, and all that stuff. And there's, there's a lot of, let's just say it, there's a lot of hate out there for ABA in different pockets of the world. Oh, yeah. There's papers getting published that are showing some statistics, some correlations between exposure to ABA and, and later experiences of trauma. And that's a very we, controversial paper that you're referencing. I, I know it's a controversial right. paper, but the word is out there in the court of public opinion. I fully agree. It's a controversial paper, but that doesn't mean that the word's not out, that we're not on notice and that uh, there's also kind of children getting hurt and restraints more and more. And those aren't necessarily at the hands of behavior analysts, but oftentimes when you walk into a school, there's a behavior specialist who's putting plans in place that involves some of those things. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about kids with really severe problem behavior, behavior analysis has an amazing worldview and set of tools to address those problems. And I think it's super, it's, it's to me, it's a little scary to think that there might be infighting that would preclude the development of those techniques and help us progress. We do all have share values and and goals. And I I think I'm, I'm hopeful to see us moving towards that. Well put. Yes. Well, I don't know why I'm surprised, but I really thought we were going to cover every single possible permutation of research related to the ISCA in this episode <laughs> uh, in that hour and a half or whatever we have. And, and then I'm always surprised, like, we've got so much more we need to talk about. <laughs> but oh, well, that's always the case, isn't it? <laughs> that's yep. a good problem to have, that there, <laughs> there's always some more we can say and there's always going to be new research to talk about. So I hope that everyone out there listening feels if they knew about the ISCA, they've learned some new things. And if they had no idea what the ISCA was, that they have a pretty good sense of what it is and where they can find some more research. And if you are comfortable, D2, would you mind sharing your information if people are interested and would like to contact you about what the best information might be to get on the ISCA in terms of, you know, some your recommendations on some research papers they should be looking at? Oh, yeah, I'd be very happy to do that. Probably the strongest resource is a website called www.practicalfunctionalassessment.com. But I'd be happy to share my information. Uh, You know, I'm also down at UMBC. We're looking for eager, bright young minds to come learn about behavior analysis. You are. Am I allowed to shamelessly (laughs) plug? Yeah, Yeah, you You guys get like a minute of ad space to talk about Regis. (laughs) (laughs) Competitor. (laughs) That's true. That's true. That's true. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Someone's in Maryland. They're like, I don't know. I was thinking of driving all the way to Weston for school. I mean, you know, there might be closer options. Plug away, you two. Plug away. (laughs) Yeah, if you're close. Bye. We got some. I mean, I'm personally can't really even believe that I'm working here because I've heard about this UMBC graduate program for a very, very long time. They're affiliated with the Kennedy Krieger Institute down in Baltimore. And graduate students, a lot of the graduate students will work at the Kennedy Krieger Institute. And they do obviously some of the best work that we've ever known in the field. But recently, I was brought on, and another a colleague of mine, Dr. Morella Sanger, was brought on, and us together with Dr. John Barrero. We're hoping to build a sort of center for behavior analysis on campus at UMBC to kind of integrate some other projects as well. So there's there's just a lot of great stuff happening down there. I'm super excited and lucky to be a part of it. And we're looking for people at all levels of academia, undergraduate, master's, as well as doctoral. So I, I'd be happy to post my information in any prospective students should please feel free to reach out to me. We'll have a link to, if you have an email, you don't mind sharing, we'll have a link to it in our About Us section of the website. People can go to abainsidetrack.com and they can see a, a picture of you and they can see your bio and then a link to that. But if folks would rather just just immediately email you, what would be the best place they could contact you? My email address is a Rajaraman. that's R-A-J-A-R-A-M-A-N, at umbc.edu. So it's arajaraman at umbc.edu. Awesome. 
Well, D2, thank you so much for coming on tonight and talking to us all about the ISCA. It was a lot of fun and you had a lot of awesome information and you shared some great papers with us. And we, we very, very much appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. This it was fun. Is it's your dream come years. true. Yes. I think you mentioned it briefly, but I spoke with you guys at Babbitt in like 2016. Yeah. And I was yeah. just fanboying super hard and I'm still a pretty <laughs> big fanboy. And I think that, so you guys have eclipsed 100 episodes at this point, correct? Yeah. We're over 100. Yes. Yep. Just so remarkable. And each one's better than the last. And, oh. Well, oh, no. Oh, stop. Stop. <laughs> except for this one. <laughs> oh, come on. I didn't mean to say that. Like, so this one will be <laughs> better than the last. But I'm just going <laughs> to just stick and move, stick and move. But no, I, I truly appreciate it. It was so fun. And thank you. And Jackie, I didn't think you were a Debbie Downer at all. I think these are really fun, important things okay, for us to talk good. about. I, I was like, I don't want to like be the bearer of bad questions. Yeah, hopefully we weren't. But hard on well, you or anything. I would rather talk these out than not yeah. because I, I do think that the, there's there's mm-hmm. potentially an echo chamber thing happening yeah where we're not reading each other's work and we're not discussing mm-hmm. enough with one another so right. I mean, I'm, and that's not me versus you but i'm saying Us. with respect to this yeah. whole controversy yeah. and, right. and yeah. polarization in the field so i'm happy to have these discussions with anyone at any time at any place literally you have my email uh, well, D2, thanks so much for talking to us for such a, a nice chunk of time. Is dinner all ready? Did the pot beep? You won't believe this. Okay. It is at one minute. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad we get to give you something to do until uh, dinner. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> time to pull out that immersion blender and make this stew into a soup. So. Uh, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, thanks so much. It was such a pleasure. Oh, right, yeah. It was, it was great awesome. having you. It was nice Bye. talking to you again. We want to say one more big thanks to Dr. Adityan Rajaraman for coming on the show and talking to us all about the ISCA. We really, really do appreciate it. And again, like D2 mentioned, longtime listeners might remember him from one of our Babbitt specials way back when. He was one of the few people willing to talk to us when we were like, hi, we're doing a random BCBA like podcast. Very first. Very first. Bonus episode. Yes. Oh, <laughs> good times. Good times. Thinking way back when. And we want to, of course, thank all of you. And one of the ways we like to thank our listeners is by making sure that you can listen to ABA Inside Track for CEUs. Now, you're going to need the second secret code word. I'm going to give that to you now. It is POCKET, P-O-C-K-E-T. Like your pants probably have some pockets you can put stuff in, like your keys or your wallet. You might have had that toy Polly Pocket. That was a pretty cool toy. I sure did. I had the boy version Mighty Max. That was, was cool, too. Which was also very cool. It was actually pretty cool, too. Yeah. Did you know the spoilers for the Mighty Max cartoon? The end of the Mighty Max cartoon, many of the characters died, and then Mighty Max left his final battle to go back in time to the start of the show. So it was kind of like a cyclical comment on the syndication nature of animated programming, because once it gets to the end, it just goes right back to the beginning, and they play oh. it for the kids again. You know that is my pet peeve about all those things. That what? That just goes around again? They just, you're like, hey, this person's dead! But don't worry, they'll come right back. Well, he doesn't come back. He just goes back in time. Hmm. You see, he's different. Anyway, Polly anyway. Pocket. <laughs> pocket. Polly Pocket. Just Pocket. Not hot. Just Polly. No, Pocket. <laughs> pocket. Longest code word ever. Pocket. Okay. Woo. All right, everybody. Well, we want to say thanks so much for listening to AB Inside Track. We hope you enjoyed our show. If so, we'd really, really love it if you subscribed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Maybe leave us a little review telling us what you liked or didn't like or would like us to change. That'd be nice. If you'd like to find us on social media to tell us any of that information, you can. We're on Pinterest, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram as ABA Inside Track. You can also go to the website, abainsidetrack.com, and you can find us on YouTube where these episodes get posted with the YouTube subtitling features. If you're so interested, you can also feel free to send us an email directly at abainsidetrack at gmail.com. Of course, thanks to Kyle Sturry for our interstitial music, and big thanks to Dr. Jim Carr for our intro and outro theme song. And speaking of which... We'll be back next week with another full-length episode. But until then, keep responding. Bye!